And what I really love about traditional Chinese medicine is it's very holistic. And it's looking again at the whole person, at all systems working together. And it really meshes beautifully with what I think of as nursing practice, as nurses that we step back and we are looking at the whole person and how maybe a, an imbalance in one area of one's life can definitely impact other areas as well. Again, using that view of looking at the whole person, we can provide some acupuncture or acupressure that can help them better manage treatment moving forward. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. Today, we're talking with ONS member, Susan Yaguda, RN Manager in Integrative Oncology at the Atrium Health Levine Cancer Institute in North Carolina, about using acupuncture and acupressure to manage symptoms and side effects of cancer and cancer treatment. You can also earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks for joining us today, Susan. Thank you, Stephanie. It's good to be here. So, Susan, you spoke at our ONS Congress this year in April on this topic, and we had a great response to your session and a lot of people who were very intrigued by the information that you provided. So for those who are listening, who were not able to be there, can you briefly explain what acupuncture and acupressure are? So these are modalities that are often used in integrative medicine, and they come from traditional Chinese medicine. They've been around for thousands of years. The concepts of traditional Chinese medicine have a framework that's very different from what we consider westernized medicine. So they look at the body as being made up of pathways called meridians. And I like to sort of relate these to like your vascular system or your nervous system, although you can't see them. And then all along the pathways are literally hundreds of points called acupoints. And the acupoints are kind of, if you might want to think of little stopping points almost of what is called chi, which is life force energy that flows through the meridians. When people have a disruption in their health, and it could be your emotional well being, it could be physical, it could be both. In traditional Chinese medicine, it is reflected in that the flow of chi has been disrupted. And so what acupuncture and acupressure do is they address this by trying to open up and even out that flow by either inserting tiny little needles called acupuncture needles or by exerting gentle pressure called acupressure on specific acupoints. Very different than what we're used to thinking with health and wellness. That's kind of the basis of this modality. Thank you. So you mentioned traditional Chinese medicine. Can you talk about some of the basic concepts of that? In traditional Chinese medicine, they think about the flow of energy and they call this energy qi. It's pronounced qi, but it's spelled Q-I. This is our life force energy. This is what gives us health and well-being. This is what brings balance to our existence. And it flows along those pathways all throughout the body. And then All along those are acupoints that correspond with an area of well-being. It's a little bit difficult to describe in view because in traditional Chinese medicine, they truly look at the whole body and the whole person, the whole experience. So somebody could be experiencing, for example, some disruption in qi, 
And that could be exhibited symptom-wise as digestive issues, difficulty sleeping perhaps, anxiety maybe, headaches maybe. And what traditional Chinese medicine, they would say it's a disruption in, whereas in more westernized medicine, we would say, oh, they have a tension headache or they're constipated and treat those symptoms more individually. So what I really love about traditional Chinese medicine is it's very holistic and it's looking again at the whole person, at all systems working together. And it really meshes beautifully with what I think of as nursing practice, as nurses that we step back and we are looking at the whole person and how maybe uh, an imbalance in one area of one's life can definitely impact other areas as well. So the three main concepts are qi, that QI, that life energy, the meridians, which are like the pathways, and then the acupoints, which are just little stops all along the meridians. Thank you for explaining those concepts. I think those of our listeners, you know, who this information is new to, it's a great explanation of how that works. So how does Western medicine's view of acupuncture and acupressure compare to that of the traditional Chinese medicines? So Western medicine is going to look at things from their own lens. The concept is a little bit difficult to really get a good handle on from a Western perspective. There are some possibilities that using acupuncture might create some opioid modulation, which impacts pain perception, perhaps. It could cause, for example, vasodilation, which could impact somebody's perception of a painful experience, for example. And there's also, you know, I think this fits into both areas of looking at health and well-being, is the concept of being cared for and being touched and having that attention that we know that that in and of itself can have a really positive impact on somebody's well-being as well. Whereas in traditional Chinese medicine, again, they're looking at using acupuncture and acupressure to open up qi, to improve the flow of qi. And in that way, it is going to result in improved symptoms. So as we mentioned, you know, we're talking about this as far as how this can help patients to manage side effects and symptoms from their treatment. Can you talk a little bit about how acupuncture and acupressure is believed to do that? We're just kind of entering into the evidence behind all of this. So the why I may not be able to clearly describe, but what we're seeing, what the literature is seeing, I definitely can share. So we're seeing that patients, for example, we know that patients who receive neurotoxic chemotherapies can develop painful neuropathy that can really be impactful on their quality of life. We have found, and the literature also supports, that if patients can come in and get some sessions of acupuncture, that it can be really impactful on their neuropathy. It may not for everyone make their neuropathy completely go away but it could at least improve it to the point where they're safe to walk or they can button their shirt up without difficulty. We're also excited to see that having patients receive something like acupuncture while receiving potentially neurotoxic chemotherapy could possibly help reduce the need for dose reductions because of neuropathic symptoms and enable them to stay better on the prescribed treatment plan. So I always encourage patients and I encourage our providers who refer to get their patients in sooner rather than later so that we can have an impactful, hopefully, effect on that symptom especially. We know also that patients that experience nausea and vomiting from their chemotherapy can also benefit from acupuncture and acupressure. One of the common points that I think a lot of us are familiar with is called PC6 or pericardium 6. Sometimes it's also just called P6. And that's the point on your inner wrist that if you wear those C bands, those little stretchy bands, and they have a little button on them, oftentimes people wear them when they're going on a ship or a boat. 
It does help with motion sickness at times. And that's a really common acupoint for us to look at our patients using for chemotherapy-related nausea and vomiting. Other things are our patients with head and neck cancers who are receiving treatments such as radiation and hand surgery. We can help with dry mouth with them as well. The evidence is just starting to build for that application of acupuncture. You know, so far it looks promising for those folks too. And dry mouth can definitely interfere with their nutritional status and just overall quality of life as well. Then sleep is another common problem that we find our patients experience difficulty with. Sometimes sleep disturbances are treatment related, whether they're on steroids maybe or something else that's stimulating, but oftentimes it's due to anxiety. So again, using that view of looking at the whole person, we can provide some acupuncture or acupressure to help maybe reduce anxiety, to help them relax a little bit more, settle their thinking down a little bit, and get some improved sleep, which as we all know, that's just a very important part of health and well-being and definitely for our patients, something that can help them better manage treatment moving forward as well. So those are just kind of some ways that it can help manage those very common side effects that we see in our patients. There's a whole lot of other ways to use acupuncture and acupressure that's probably well beyond my scope of expertise in this area. It's just fascinating to see the evidence start to build and more research trials and more anecdotal positive outcomes as well. Susan, it's great to hear that the evidence for using this is really starting to build because I feel like integrative medicine, complementary medicine, it's changed over the years and what we call that sometimes has been looked at as something that might be helpful, but really didn't have the evidence behind it to show that it was. So hearing you talk about that evidence is just great for nurses and also for nurses talking with their patients about being able to use this as an option for them to help in managing their side effects and symptoms. Yeah, it's really encouraging. And, you know, you talked about the name change even from complementary and alternative medicine, you know, through the NIH office, and it was changed to complementary and integrative. And that was a really intentional switch to focus more on the evidence-based interventions Integrative looks at using complementary therapies in a very collaborative way with what we would consider to be more conventional medical treatment so that it's coordinated and very intentionally meshed together, if you will, to best suit the patient's needs at whatever point along the trajectory of their care. It is exciting to see kind of the shift and how these things are perceived. We also know our patients are using complementary, integrative, and alternative therapies. So it's really important that we kind of open up the conversation about that so that we can guide them to using those things that are safe and evidence-based for them. So, you know, having that research kind of start to catch up with practice is just super important to help support those conversations as well. I agree with that. I think it's really important for nurses to be the ones to open that up since patients do trust them and they spend more time with the nurses. And so they have the ability to kind of talk through things and talk about what that patient is using outside of their care at the hospital if they are. I would say that with our listeners, some are new to oncology. You know, this is such a good bit of information for them to start to learn and understand because this is something that nurses could then kind of encourage or suggest to patients if their facility would have an integrative oncology department to help with symptom management. Would you agree with that? Definitely. To your point, patients are going to be comfortable having those conversations with their trusted 
clinical team, especially their nurse, they may tell the nurse things that they're not going to tell their physician even. Patients tend to have a fear of bringing up some of the things that they're doing just because they think the physician may say kind of poo-poo it or there might be a sense of embarrassment about it. Or some are even afraid that their doctor will say, I'm not going to treat you if you're going to be doing that. So we can definitely have a role to be good listeners and communicators and then also good advocates for making sure our patients are getting the right information. Because we do know also there's a lot of incorrect information out there as well. Absolutely. So you mentioned a few of the side effects that patients might be utilizing this therapy for, this integrative medicine for. Can you talk a little bit about what are the ways that patients with cancer can use acupuncture and acupressure? Some cancer centers do have an integrative medicine department, and oftentimes acupuncture is part of that. We're fortunate here to have that in our facility. And we went to having individual acupuncture sessions to primarily a group model. And the group model is really a blending of the westernized concept of shared medical appointment and then the traditional Chinese medicine concept of community acupuncture. And so patients come in at 15-minute increments They don't have to change their clothes. They have to wear loose, comfortable clothes that they can roll their pant legs up and their shirt sleeves up. But the benefit is that the acupuncturist can use what's called distal acupoints. And those are like knees down, elbows down, head, face, neck, and ears. And still be able to, because again, of the foundations of traditional Chinese medicine, still be able to treat a wide variety of symptoms. And so the patients are assessed independently and they're treated very individually. But in our group acupuncture session, they're treated again, just using those distal points. Sometimes in different places, you can find acupuncture being provided even in the infusion suite while people are actually receiving chemotherapy. We have not done that yet in our institution. There's been a little bit of pushback from leaders to implement that. However, this is a great place for us to consider acupressure, which is, again, instead of using needles, is just applying some gentle pressure on a point to still elicit maybe not as deep of a response, but still a positive response. Then if patients don't have these resources within their cancer care setting, sometimes they may find that there are those individuals in their community. And I just tell patients if they're going out in the community to get care that that's great. And most acupuncturists do have some experience with helping patients with cancer. But just to make sure that obviously that the acupuncturist is licensed that the facility is very clean. It's okay to ask, do you have experience working with someone who is being treated with cancer? And if they're not comfortable with that, typically they will have a cohort of other professionals they can share with you. And then going back to acupressure, for us as nurses, I always tell people from across the country to check with their state board of licensing But in North Carolina, for example, where I practice, it is okay for nurses to utilize acupressure as a nursing intervention. As long as we've gotten appropriate training that's been approved by our institution. And so we're doing that at our institution where we have some continuing education for nurses. They learn maybe six or seven different acupoints that would be commonly used for the symptoms that we're going to see in our patients. And then they demonstrate that they can find those points. They show that they understand some of the precautions around using acupressure. And then they're able to provide this directly as part of nursing care to our patients. They can use it in an infusion suite. They can use it, for example, reducing anxiety associated with poor access, for example, or for preparation for radiation treatment. They can use it on the inpatient side for preparation for sleep even. And I almost liken using acupressure 
as part of our nursing care as similar to, you know, when I was first going out into nursing, doing a back rub in the evening and preparation for a restful night for our patient was just a really sacred part of nursing care that we provided. A lot went into that time together, not just that you were rubbing your patients back and making them comfortable, but it was time to connect with them during something that would be considered a very healing moment together. And acupressure can definitely be considered at those moments as well. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. And also it's quite safe to provide as well. And then lastly, in this area, I would just like to also mention that our care partners not only could they use maybe some acupressure themselves to help with fatigue and anxiety and their own sleep difficulties, but it gives them something that they can be easily trained to do to share with their loved one. And sometimes it's so important for them to feel like they can contribute positively to their loved one's well-being in some sort of way. So I always encourage, if possible, for a care partner to be involved in the process as well. That's great when you talk about involving their caregiver, care partner in all of this so that they know what is going on and how these things can help their loved ones that they are taking care of or helping with. So you mentioned about some ways that we teach our patients and or the caregivers about this. So what are if you can explain to us some easy to find acupressure points. Sure. So I will do my best since we don't have any visual as part of the podcast, but I'll do my best to describe one point that I like to use myself, especially if I need to really concentrate on something. Maybe it's a project or something that I'm trying to work on and just need to be focused. It's a point called GV20 or governing vessel 20. This is also referred to as the 100 meeting point. And it's not like we're having 100 meetings by any means. It's where in traditional Chinese medicine, many of the meridians converge. And so that's where it comes up with the name 100 meeting point. This is easy to find and to perform acupressure for yourself on as well as on someone else. So you're just going to think about the midline of your head. So straight up your face, between your eyebrows, all the way to the very top of your head. And then think about going the other direction, if you will, from the tip of one ear to the tip of the other. Where are those two lines? intersect is about where GV20 will be located. And you can usually take your thumb and kind of move it around that area. And you may find a little tender spot, if you will. It shouldn't be painful, but you can maybe tell a bit of a difference. And it may be even in a little dip in there in your skull. And then what I recommend people do is with their thumb, just massage in a circular motion using pressure that you can feel the pressure, but it's not painful pressure again. So you can kind of self-regulate in that way for anywhere from like a minute to three minutes. Just, you know, take some nice little breaths while you're doing it and enjoy just the effect of that to kind of increase concentration and focus. And it may also be a nice point to activate to help increase fatigue. So perhaps it's that dip in the middle of the afternoon and you just need to be kind of focused still during your day. You could just activate that point for a minute to three minutes, again, just with a gentle massage. So that's called, again, GV20 or governing vessel 20 and also referred to as the 100 meeting point. Super easy to find. Another point that I really enjoy sharing with other people because especially the past two and a half now years, we've been all pretty stressed out and managing increased anxiety associated just with living through this pandemic. And this point is called yin tang. Again, it's super easy to find this point. It's on your face, right in between your eyebrows at the top of your nose. And again, I recommend taking your thumb 
and pressing gently. You usually can find a little bit of a tender spot there. And then just do a nice little circular massage with your thumb. And when I say that, you know, you're keeping your thumb in contact with the skin and with the point, but you're activating that point by exerting some pressure. And again, that little tiny movement with that. And yin tang can also be good for helping with anxiety to helping just kind of calm the nervous system down so that you can, again, just be able to address whatever needs to be addressed with a calmer head together, if you will. I mentioned also PC6 or the pericardium 6. And I'll just describe this point as well, because this is the one that's commonly used for nausea that we are most familiar with those C bands with a little button on them. And this point, if you take one of your hands and you turn it palm up and then take your other hand and put three fingers, three fingers together, you're going to place the third finger, which typically is your ring finger, if you're doing it on yourself, right on the crease of your wrist. And then right above your pointer finger, In between, you have two tendons there in your lower arm on the inside. The point is right above three finger width above your crease of your wrist in between those two tendons. And again, if you feel around in there, typically you'll find a little bit of a tender spot and then you can just kind of try to activate it by some gentle massage. This is really a nice one to share with patients who are receiving chemotherapy, who might be feeling kind of some nausea come on. I like to have our patients know about this, that they can then treat themselves at home as well. There's several more that we could talk about, but just to give you an idea, those are some easy to find points that we can use both for ourselves and also for our loved ones as well as for our patients. Thank you. That was a great explanation. And I'm sure that many of our listeners will be rewinding and pausing to try some of those points that you just talked about for us. Can you describe for us what auricular acupuncture and acupressure is? Yeah. So this is really, in my mind, very fascinating. So auricular means just using the ear. In Chinese medicine, there is diagrams that you can find that have what's called the humunculus. So it's an upside down baby skeleton that sort of folds right into the ear. And all around the ear, there are hundreds of different acupoints, like more than I could ever mention. And auricular acupuncture and acupressure use just those points in the ear. Those are great points for things like Tobacco cessation, for example, there's a good point to use in your ear for that. There are good points for use. There's one point in there. I can sort of try to describe to you how to find it. It's called Shen Men that we use often for our patients who are receiving hormone therapy and are experiencing hot flashes. If you worked with patients who are experiencing hot flashes from their cancer treatment, it can be really debilitating. So they will come in and get some acupuncture and Shenmen is typically a point that the acupuncturist will use. It's on the outside of the ear. And just to clarify, all of the auricular acupoints are along the outer aspect of the ear. There's nothing that we're inserting inside the ear canal by any means. Some people have even gotten Shenmen pierced, which is not something that I necessarily recommend because it is cartilage. But we also have what's called acupressure seeds. They're little tiny pellets typically made out of a plant source called vicaria. These little tiny seeds, sometimes they're made out of steel or titanium or something. But again, they're really small and they're typically on an adhesive. And so oftentimes we will also put on Shenmen an auricular acupressure seed And it can stay on for a day to three days or so. And then the person receiving the treatment can just press on that seed throughout the day to elicit a positive response. I have had teammates who are going through menopause and experiencing hot flashes swear by having their Shenmen seed in place that it has really helped them. 
But that is, again, a really popular point that we use. And then there's other, the acupuncturist would be also able to use many other points just along the aspect of the outer ear as well, both for inserting needles and then again for using acupressure. It's so interesting how there's just so many points on our body as well as just on the ear, like you mentioned, and then talking about those small seeds that are on the adhesive that patients can have placed. It's just a wonderful, non-invasive way to help patients out during their treatment time. It is. It's really fascinating. And, you know, I always pause and remind myself too that they have been doing this for thousands of years. We're just now really implementing it as part of our more traditional care. And yet this has been going on for much longer than any of us have been walking this earth. Exactly. (laughs) Can you talk to us a little bit about the battlefield protocol? So the battlefield protocol is a very specific set of auricular points. So points just on the ear. It was established by a military physician who wanted to provide some quick help to soldiers who had been injured in the field. So the main use of these points is for pain management. There's very specific points associated with the protocol. Acupuncturists need to get additional training in order to provide battlefield acupuncture. And the needles are slightly different. So the needles for regular acupuncture are very thin and tiny, uh, about the size of human hair. And for battlefield acupuncture, They're very tiny needles, but they have almost, it sounds a little awful to think about it, but they're really tiny little barbs on the end of the needle. And what this does is that once the needles are inserted on those designated points, they can stay in place for a few days. This is something that's starting to gain traction in medical settings, which is really exciting to see. It's sometimes used in emergency departments, sometimes for orthopedic practices or for trauma care. We haven't yet used it in our institution, but I do think that there's potential for it to be used in cancer care, for example, for palliative medicine care to assist. I do want to just emphasize that using the battlefield acupuncture or acupuncture and acupressure of any kind is not a replacement for appropriate medical management of symptoms, whether it's pain or nausea or anxiety, for example. But just to think about this as another tool in the toolbox to offer to our patients that has very few side effects. We may be able to reduce the amount, for example, of opioid medication that somebody may need to take if they respond positively to acupuncture, including perhaps a battlefield protocol but it should never be considered as a replacement for that type of care. Thank you. That's very, very interesting. The next thing I want to ask you about, because this may be a question that whether it's patients or clinicians who have never worked with integrative oncology or acupuncture or acupressure before, are there safety concerns with using acupuncture and acupressure? There definitely are. I think in the context of cancer care, they're pretty low risk. However, we do have policy in place to maintain the safest environment we can for our patients receiving this. So for example, if someone has a very low white blood cell count because of their treatment, we may suggest they defer receiving acupuncture And just to keep them, of course, out of the institution and safer at home, but also there's a very, very minimal risk of infection because you are inserting for acupuncture needles in slightly into the skin. And just because patients may be so immunocompromised, we want to make sure that we're being especially mindful of that. And so for those patients, we may suggest some acupressure, for example, at home in the meantime until their white count can pop up a little bit. We also check their platelet count 
we have kind of a standard in my institution that we reach out to the providers for guidance and what their recommendation is to receive acupuncture if the platelet counts, for example, are below 50. Some of our hematology providers are more liberal with that and a platelet count of 30 is fine. Again, the risk is very, very small. There's not really bleeding from using acupuncture because the needles don't go all the way through the skin. But somebody may experience slight bruising, for example, at the point of insertion. And we just caution around that if somebody does have kind of a borderline low platelet count. There's some points that shouldn't be used, for example, in cases of pregnancy. Again, the evidence is a little bit weak in this area, but it's one of those kind of sacred cows and acupuncture treatment that there would be specific points that you should avoid if a patient was pregnant, potentially because it could induce premature contractions. But again, that is another risk that is very minimal. And then we do also have patients that are severely needle phobic. And even though I sort of have to chuckle because I think about everything that our patients go through and they just have this perception of acupuncture being, you know, they're going to be stuck with all these needles all over the place. And it's nothing like the needle that, for example, you would get a blood draw from or an IV from. It's so tiny. And so for these patients, we can recommend acupressure and provide that for them and train them how to self-administer. But we can also have them just come in and just actually visually see what the acupuncture needle looks like. You know, if they're willing, we can pop one in and they can just see that it doesn't go into their skin very far. And typically when we're able to do that, then they're willing to give it a try. And then once they do experience and have a positive outcome from it, they realize that they're fine coming in for a series of appointments with that. We have had some patients who have had some mental health conditions that have not made it safe for them to come in and have acupuncture needles placed. And again, for those patients, we would try to work with them and train them how to provide self-acupressure or work with their loved one to help with that as well. But generally, this is a very safe intervention. I think it's just really important for any patient to understand that, you know, you only use a, a licensed and trained acupuncturist, of course. Some physicians can also take additional training and then they are as well a credential to provide acupuncture too. So that is also another option, but overall very safe, particularly in the context of cancer care. Thank you. So I want to kind of change gears a little bit because you have mentioned a few times that patients aren't the only ones that use acupressure. And with so many things that have gone on as kind of was alluded to earlier over the past two and a half years, you know, not only with patients, but also with nurses and the stress that nurses have been under. How can oncology nurses use it for their own self-care? That is so important. I'm glad that you brought that up because it's really something that is near and dear to my heart as well. And so some of the points that I mentioned earlier, like the 100 meeting point at the top of your head, yin tang, the point that's on your forehead right between your eyebrows, those are good for focus, for reducing anxiety. Another thing that we often have difficulties with is sleep during this challenging time. And, you know, certainly a lot of people in our country have difficulty with sleep anyway, and certainly nurses do as well. There is another point that's quite easy to find called anmion that is useful for difficulty sleeping. And so I encourage, you know, nurses who are having some trouble because we can manage life so much better when we've had a full night's sleep. But to use this point, and if I can just briefly describe how you could find this one, it's behind your ears. So, you know, behind each ear, you have kind of that bump, that bony prominence, and you're going to move your finger just below and behind this. And again, you may find that little tender spot there. And there's kind of a little divot, if you will, below and behind that bony prominence and back of your ear. 
And that's Anne Mien. And you can do both sides. You can do both sides at once, or you can press with a finger or thumb on one side, do again that circular gentle massage, and then do the other side. But that's a great point for helping improve sleep. I love to teach our nurses how to share acupressure with their patients. But before we even do that, I want them to experience it for themselves because then they will be good ambassadors for their patient care, but they can also take it home and use for their own self-care and use for their families as well. You know, when I think about nurses who are also going home to stressed out kids or stressed out partners and how we everybody could use a little bit of self-care. And this is just such a simple and easy and accessible and no cost way to provide that, that I just think it's really important. Again, isn't going to fix every problem in the book. You know, think of it as another tool in your toolbox. Thank you. I think that is just wonderful that you give nurses that same information. And I agree with you. If they use it, they're definitely going to be ambassadors for patients, you know, to use this as well. So thank you for telling us that. Susan, I just want to thank you so much for being on with me today. And this is such an interesting topic and something that is, you know, as you have mentioned, you know, the evidence is growing for and a wonderful way for patients to learn and take on their own symptom management and side effect management with things that they can do. So it's just very, very interesting. And we're getting close to the end of our time. So there are a couple questions that I always end our conversation with. And I want to ask those to you now, and we're going to go real quick fire. And the first one that I have is what are some common misconceptions about using acupuncture and acupressure to manage cancer symptoms and side effects? Well, some people don't believe that it would work or help. And so those are kind of the people that I enjoy most working with because there's nothing better than a skeptic who suddenly is starting to notice that they're feeling a little bit better. So that's definitely a misconception that there's nothing behind it, that it's just placebo. It's again, been around for thousands of years and the evidence in Western medicine is growing that it could be a really impactful evidence-based way to help care for our patients. The other thing that that I always like to reiterate, and you know, I've said it already today, but this isn't like the one shot deal for helping patients manage their symptoms and side effects. This is again, just one aspect of their holistic care. This doesn't take the place to appropriate use of medication or other types of therapies. I would never want a patient to be concerned that they weren't going to get their pain medication because now they're receiving acupuncture. You know, not the case at all. We work very hand in hand with our conventional care providers. And then safety, as I had mentioned, this is a very safe and effective intervention for patients, both acupuncture and even more so acupressure. And so when you kind of weigh risk with potential benefit, it definitely comes up way ahead. Thank you. What is something about this topic that's not often discussed, but you do wish people knew more about? Oftentimes people say, well, I don't have access to an acupuncturist, so I'm not going to kind of dig into this. And that's really what kind of spurred on my interest in acupressure as part of a nursing intervention. There are ways to learn how to provide this. It's not difficult care to learn as nurses to do. So I do encourage, even if at your institution, you do not have an acupuncturist available, if you do have one in your community, oftentimes they're excited to work with others to show them some acupoints that you could use for acupressure treatment. And then of course, just always check with your state board of nursing and check with your institution leadership and institution education leaders as well to make sure that nurses can get the training that could be helpful for them to provide this type of therapy as part of nursing care. 
What additional training or resources do oncology nurses need to understand acupuncture and acupressure? The training specifically for nurses is a bit limited for acupressure. For acupuncture, you are required to go to acupuncture school and obtain that degree and then become licensed by your state. As I had mentioned, physicians can take additional training and be qualified to provide acupuncture as part of their care, but there is not in most areas available for nurses to do. I do have some colleagues, for example, in Israel who are able to get some training and be able to provide this care for their patients. However, it is quite limited, not just in the U.S., but around the globe. Whereas acupressure, I think we have a lot of opportunity there. And again, I recommend talking to an acupuncturist in your community, seeing if they would be willing to do some training. There are some things in the nursing literature, even on ONS, there are some programs that people have rolled out and I've reached out to them to say, how did you do this training? How did you make sure that everybody knew what they were doing? And They're always willing to kind of share those experiences. And so from that, we have started to build our own training program for nurses. I always try to incentivize it with some education credit as well. But again, have it be something that can be not only learning visually, but also experientially so that they can experience it on one another and then feel more confident to share it with their patients. And then what are some additional resources for patients as well as providers who just want to learn more? The Society for Integrative Oncology is an international society that's just focused on integrative oncology. It is made up of physician providers, yoga therapists, and the acupuncture special interest group is a group that is rapidly growing and becoming much more active within the society. That is Integrative Onc. Org, a great website to go to. The Society for Integrative Oncology has partnered with ASCO and they have developed already and they're continuing to develop practice guideline papers using integrative modalities, including acupuncture, for specific disease, cancer disease diagnoses. And so when I'm talking to physicians or APPs about integrative care, I like to pull on those guidelines because it carries some good weight with that partnership with ASCO. So that's definitely the guidelines are available on the SIO website, integrativeonc.org. ONS has also some information on complementary care that members can easily find as well. And then There's several organizations that are non-for-profits. There's one that's beyond conventional cancer care that has some information. They just changed their name and it's not coming to me right now, but there's that organization. If you look up beyond conventional cancer care, it would still pop up. And then some other cancer institutions, Memorial Sloan Kettering, for example, have some really good visuals and training for acupressure that is really encouraging to see there. They have a very robust acupuncture program in that institution and, you know, have been able to do a good job getting that information across. Susan, thank you so much for being with me today and for your experience and expertise. It's great to talk to someone who has such a passion about that, not only for patients, but for nurses as well. Just such an interesting topic. So I really thank you for being with me. And do you have any final comments for us today? I just appreciate you having me here. It's been such a pleasure. And I'm hoping that it sparks more interest in nurses to explore this area, because it it does open up a lot more possibilities for us, not only to care well for our patients, but also for ourselves. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.